everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. If you're kicking around ideas about which summer crops may be good for your field, we have some resources for you. Several topics are covered on our website. Here's an example of sesame with our cropping system specialist, Josh Lofton. Today we're gonna to continue our series on summer crop and we're gonna take a look at one that's, that's uh, very unique for the state. Some folks it might be very new crop but it's actually not a new crop as far as a, a global production and that's sesame similar to soybeans it is an oil seed production uh, production system so it's it's not it's not like uh, corn or grain sorghum and, and having that grain or that grass production system but but we actually want the oil high oil crop uh, really high oil per seed on the sesame crop which makes it a very unique crop for a lot of our our varying cultural cuisine and that's where we need a lot of the oil unlike a lot of our other crops though is that there's a lot of challenges to production and that's because there's one there's, there's a lot of things that we don't know quite yet. And two, there's a lot of things that are not, uh, quote, on label uh, for the production system. So it's a little more challenging to get that sesame crop up and growing. But when you get it up and growing and close that canopy, uh, the sesame can really take off and just be a good growing crop for you. The benefit of sesame is that there are not a whole lot of diseases nor insects that even care to mess with sesame. It's a little bit of a challenging crop form. Maybe they're unique to it and they're, they're growing on it and maybe they'll get here in, in the future. But as of right now, we don't have a lot of insecticides. We don't have a lot of fungicides uh, labeled for sesame, but that's okay because most of the time we don't need them. Uh, we, we have very low pest pressure from both a disease and an insect standpoint for the sesame crop. The other thing that we see with sesame is that the benefit on double crop production is really high. It can be planted in that mid-June, late June, 1st of July, using Mother Nature to help mature out the crop and can do very well where some of our other crops start to lose yield as soon as we get into the month of July. Sesame can still have the potential to do very well. So it's, it's, it's a great fit within the state. We have a great market through Sesico and a great seed supplier. So overall, it's a good fit as long as we can find those production management or, or you're not worried about doing a little bit of trial and error, especially when it comes to weed management and harvesting to make sure that you got a good crop. I had the opportunity to talk with a, a, a wheat producer over in Noble County, Brent uh, Bole, the other day, and, and Brent was saying that, that the rain a couple weeks ago was very pivotal for his crop. What are you hearing from producers across the state? Well, producers that uh, put nitrogen down before these rains came in, they're, they're happy. The crop's looking really good. Producers that didn't put down the nitrogen, uh, their crop's not looking so well. So right now it looks like we got a Jekyll and Hyde crop. Producers with nitrogen, good test weight, probably good protein, good yields. Those that didn't put down the nitrogen, well, hopefully they won't get test weight discounts. Do you see a, a, a pivotal move in the, uh, in, the, in the price of wheat coming up soon? Well, all the news that uh, we've got coming in are for higher yields, the rain makes grain kind of middle attitude, and, and of course that's caused our prices to go down. Uh, also, as, as you look around the world, you know, it came out uh, late this week that Argentina's uh, productions, uh, their planted acres up uh, 10 year high, uh, the crops looking relatively good. They raised uh, Ukraine's uh, yields and production estimates. They raised Russia's production estimates. All the reports coming in are, are bullish for production and uh, bearish for price. And of course, all of this while we still have wheat in the bin right now. Uh, we've got a lot of wheat still in the bin. Uh, I, in uh, talking to the elevators, they're cleaning bins, getting ready for this crop. I think they're hoping for some good quality coming in. I've uh, talked to uh, a, uh, a, a elevator operator that's got several million bushels. Uh, they're, uh, you know, a, a broker. They're moving wheat out of the locals into these central elevator units so that they can clear space for this upcoming crop. So with all of that said, this, this, this looks like a, a, a low price year, but we've seen these before. Right, uh, we've watched the price uh, fall off, what, 30, 40 cents over the last couple of weeks as we get this rain and as things improve and as the information comes in around the world, and it's really the world information that's having a bigger price impact than local information. Uh, you go back to 2012, from this time in, we uh, trended down as we got into harvest. Uh, wheat prices were in the 350 range. 
Uh, we got to uh, July 1, uh, we hit $4, and, and by September, the early September, we had hit $6, and in 12, I mean in 10, by we got to February, we had $9 wheat. But that, uh, the prices came when we started getting uh, negative reports on the foreign crop. Happened in 12. Now in 12, we did to get started out with, with $6 wheat, but in June 15, we had $6 wheat, and by July the 9th, we had $9 wheat. And again, it's reports coming in from foreign crops uh, that weren't as coming in as good as expected or weren't going to be as good as we earlier expected. And, 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 and we won't know that until the wheat starts harvesting. That's exactly correct. I don't think we'll, now we may get slightly higher prices as, as we move into harvest if the yields aren't coming in as high as expected. But I think any big move is going to be with changes in expectations on the foreign crop, and I don't think we'll see that until you get into the July, August, September. Uh, if you're looking at, say, when we're going to have $5 wheat, right. I think we're either going to have $5 wheat September, October of this year or September and October of 18. Okay, thank you much, Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. As we catalog the rains that fell the two weeks from April 4th to April 18th, there were some real winners and losers. The Oklahoma Mesonet Station at Medill collected two and 87 hundredths inches over those 14 days. 12 miles away at Ardmore, they were asking what rain? From April 4th to the 18th, Ardmore only collected 36 hundredths of an inch. And to make the lack of rain worse, at Ringling to the west, the rain total was two and 74 hundredths inches of rain. The blue areas on our map received less than an inch, and like Ardmore, three other sites recorded less than a half inch. That rainfall pattern is repeated in the percent of plant available water from the surface down to 16 inches. The areas with less rainfall are the yellowish areas with lower percents of plant available water. Going deeper from the surface to 32 inches, Eric in the west and Eufaula in the east were the driest two locations at only 35% of their soil's plant available water capacity. Hopefully the places that missed out on those rains will be celebrating when the next rains come through the state. Here's Gary with more weather info. Thanks Alan, good morning everyone. Well I keep promising you a better drought monitor map after each week's broadcast. And here we go again with another great looking map. Let's take a look at the latest drought monitor. You can see massive changes across central and western Oklahoma. We now just have a small blob of uh, moderate drought up from Ellis, Woodward, up into uh, Woods County in the northwest. Most of the panhandle is now drought free. Uh, we just have some abnormally dry conditions. We still see that area of concern down across uh, southeast up through northeast Oklahoma. Uh, Central Oklahoma just uh, abnormally dry and hopefully um, we can get rid of some more of these colors. Now here's a 60 day rainfall map. Uh, this is for Wednesday, April 19th, so this is before any rains that occurred after this. Um, hopefully we received some good rains across the state, especially across that eastern area. Uh, but you can see where the rain has been concentrated, uh, sort of along the I-44 corridor and also in far southeastern Oklahoma, uh, but also some great rains up uh, in the Panhandle, and some of that was actually snow. So uh, that's uh, the result um, we see when we look at the latest drought monitor map. Uh, lots of improvements. And we may not be done with the rain yet. If we take a look at this eight to 14 day precipitation outlook, uh, this is for April 26th through May 2nd, we do see increased odds of above normal precipitation for that period uh, across most of the center of the US. Um, and for late April, early May, above normal rainfall would mean some pretty good uh, moisture for the state. So let's take a look next week at the drought monitor map and I'll bet we will see more improvements and that's great news. That's it for this week. We'll see you next week on the Mesonet Weather Report. While I was in practice, one of the conditions that I saw in small ruminants, sheep and goats, was urolithiasis. 
Now this is the condition in which stones are formed in the urinary tract. We commonly refer to this as urinary calculi or bladder stones. Now there are many factors that will lead to this disease. Animals that don't drink enough water, uh, diets that are high in phosphorus, which are usually associated with high grain, low phosphorus diets, urinary tract infections, high magnesium in the diet will all contribute to this disease. Now stones are formed with the equal frequencies in female and male animals, but most of the time the diseases we see will be in castrated animals. Now the clinical signs that you might see with these animals are going to be associated with animals that are straining to urinate. You may actually even think they are constipated. They will usually dribble urine or, or produce small volumes of urine. That urine will usually have a blood tinge to it. Uh, these animals will a lot of times be in pain. Goats a lot of times will vocalize when they try to urinate. You may see tail flagging, that, fl that tail going up and down while they're trying to urinate. There'll be abdominal pain associated with this, so they may look at their sides, they may kick at their bellies, they may shift their weight from one hind leg to the other. Since treatment of the disease is often poor, preventing the disease is much more rewarding. Preventing the disease focuses on mainly, make sure these animals drink adequate amounts of water. You may need to make sure that water source is clean, make sure there's adequate space for all animals to get a drink, want to make sure that water is warm in freezing conditions, want to make sure in the summer when it's hot that it may be slightly cooler. Be sure and look at the ration, make sure it's balanced. We don't want to have too much magnesium or phosphorus. And those high grain, low roughage diets, we're probably going to need to add calcium to the diet, want to keep that calcium phosphorus ratio two to one. Treatment of this disease revolves around reestablishing urine flow. We sometimes can do this medically by maybe as simple as passing a catheter uh, or adding a urinary acidifier to the diet to try to get those stones dissolved. Uh, but most likely it will require some type of surgical intervention. There are several techniques that can be used. You'd have to consult with your veterinarian in order to find the one that's best suited for your situation. China has been in the news a lot, and here to talk about it is Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist. Daryl, the big question is how big of a deal is China, and what's the potential for the United States? Well, China has been a large beef producing and consuming country in total for many years. Uh, however, for most of that time, China was not a player in global beef markets at all. They, they consumed internally, uh, they didn't import, they didn't export, until the last uh, four or five years, and beef consumption has grown dramatically, per capita consumption has increased, and so consumption now exceeds uh, production in China significantly, and they've grown very rapidly uh, to be, in 2016, the second largest beef importing country. So uh, the U.S. doesn't currently have access to that market. We've been out of that market since 2000. And, three. and so uh, access to that market is an important potential for the U.S. in, in coming years. Uh, if we could pick up uh, even 5% of that market, it would add about 4% to our total export. So uh, it, 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 when it happens, it will take some time, but it could be a pretty important deal for the U.S. Let's break that down a little bit and look more closely of how that phenomenon might impact the U.S. cattle market. Well, uh, you know, right now I think it's part of the bullish scenario that we're seeing in the market, cattle markets and box beef markets have been very strong. That's driven by a number of factors, including this sort of psychological impact. Obviously, we're not moving any beef into China right now, and we don't really know when we will. Uh, but in general, there are indications that both domestic and international demand for beef has been strong. So box beef prices have been strong. Fed cattle markets have been strong throughout this year. Uh, even though we know that there's large total meat supplies out there, beef production is growing as well as pork and poultry supplies. And then in terms of feeder cattle markets, are you seeing some of the same trends? 
Absolutely. Feeder cattle markets have been very strong this spring, and I, you know, it's it's obviously follows from the fed cattle markets. Uh, uh, you know, live cattle futures for the summer months, uh, the third quarter really have strengthened, so that uh, plays into demand for feeder cattle now. And, and also, it's uh, it's springtime. We've had rain, drought, uh, dry conditions have abated, so there's a lot of stocker demand for these cattle going out on grass for the summer. And speaking of stocker demand, we're involved in a, in a new survey for producers. They need to be looking in the mailbox. That's right. Um, you know, right now, producers, a number of producers in Oklahoma should be receiving a survey from, from NAS, the National Ag Statistics Survey, who is cooperating with us uh, to mail out a survey we've developed over the last few months. You know, the stocker industry is very important in Oklahoma and very important to, uh, part of the cattle industry, and yet we don't know a lot about it, or at least we haven't been able to document a lot. We don't capture a lot of what goes on in the stocker industry in our regular kinds of data stuff. So this survey is, is an attempt to fill in some of those gaps a little bit, and we sure hope that producers will take, give, us, give us a little bit of time and fill out this survey and provide us with some much needed documentation of exactly what they do and, and how they do it. And then how will that help researchers and extension folks in the future getting those numbers crunched and looking at that data? Well, it's going to provide us with several different pieces. Obviously, we're interested in, in, in how producers uh, utilize resources. The stocker industry is all about flexibility. And so, uh, you know, trying to understand how producers decide what to do, how it changes from one year to the next. A part of this as well is trying to understand movement of cattle. And when we look at things like disease threats, we don't really know how and when cattle move around the country. And that stocker segment is a big part of that. So this should provide us some additional information on, on cattle movement that uh, is, is data we simply do not have right now. Well, we'll look forward to, to hearing the results. Thanks a lot, Daryl. As we're getting a little closer to entering the start of the spring breeding season, those cow-calf producers that are going to use artificial insemination may improve their conception rates just a little bit by the time of day by which they actually inseminate the cattle. And this may come as a surprise to uh, some of you that have done this in the past because we've always talked about the old AMPM rule, which basically meant that if we saw a cow or heifer in standing estrus in the morning, that we would wait 12 hours and breed her in the evening. And conversely, if she was in standing heat in the evening hours, then 12 hours later the following morning is when we would inseminate her. More recent data, some of it very large data sets coming from the dairy industry, has shown us that the AMPM rule doesn't give us any real advantage over just breeding the cattle in the morning hours. In other words, if she's in standing estrus in the morning, we breed her in the morning. If we see her in standing heat in the evening, we wait until the following morning to inseminate her. Now, even more convincing data coming from Oklahoma State University uh, steers me towards just that, that morning breeding. What these folks looked at was the core body temperature of range cattle as they went through a, a normal summer day. And the key thing that they found was that the highest core body temperature occurred about two to five hours after the hottest time of the day. And so if uh, we're here in the breeding season and we get one of these warm spring days and we get up into the 90s, say, at about four o'clock in the afternoon, then the highest core body temperature of the cattle is going to be six o'clock to, say, 11 o'clock in the evening. And that means to me, again, that we want to wait until the following morning to work those cattle and to do our insemination. So, as we go through this breeding season, if you're going to use either timed AI or breed on heat detection, I'd really suggest that you do all of your cattle working in the early morning hours, inseminate in those uh, cooler morning hours, and I think we should have just a little bit better conception rate as a result of doing that. We hope this helps you in your, your breeding season this year, and we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about it using multimeters and uh, all the different settings. Okay, so you've got 
this multimeter here and you've got all these different things on there that you can switch to. How would I know if it was AC? It would be this squiggly line. Yes. And that's called, it, that's a sign. It's going for, it's alternating current. And the uh, DC voltage would typically have a solid line with a dashed line under it. Uh, the millivolts is, uh, is similar as well. So it, it would have the, the small M and the V. Uh, if you're looking on, on uh, most equipment, you're talking about DC voltage. So you're looking at 12 volts. Again, you got a, you got a common uh, lead and, and then for your hot as well for your voltage. So you would just touch these to wherever you're looking for your voltage. Uh, so very similar to what you would get out of a test light when you're looking at voltage, except for you're going to actually see the value as opposed to the light lighting up. Usually if you're going to do a continuity check, it'll be something that's going to have a, a sound on it as well. So Let's if see. we took that and put that on sound and we were going to check continuity. Resistance would be the uh, upside down horseshoe that's on there for ohms. You can do a diode check, which is this one right here, which you have uh, uh, current flow one way but not the other. You got amperage that you can check both uh, both DC and, uh, and AC amperage as well. You one of those you need to watch out for though because if you overamp this thing you'll you'll burn this fuse out and you'll have to replace it. Yeah. And definitely uh, if you look at, at where your uh, where your leads are connected in you'll need to know where you're going to connect those for the, the amperage on one side and, and voltage resistance continuity on the other where the the commons would stay in the center all the time. You can pick these up uh, about any store a hardware store and they'll you, their prices are our broad range. You can go from extremely less expensive, I mean real cheap, to as much as you want to pay for one. So, you know, if you're looking for one and you're just going to be doing stuff around the shop or house, why, you know, you don't need a real expensive meter. So, just a few tips on uh, using a multimeter. We'll see you next week on Shop Stop. Finally today, a look at how OSU researchers are keeping tabs on the state's bear population. SUNUP's Dave Deacon takes us right to the bear's den in southeastern Oklahoma. There are black bears in Oklahoma, but it wasn't until the late 1990s and early 2000s that the black bears started to expand from Arkansas into Oklahoma. So they're relatively um, newly returned mm -hmm. to Oklahoma, but they were native. Here. It's been a long road for black bears in Oklahoma, but Oklahoma State University researchers in collaboration with the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation were conducting den site checks while the collared female black bears were hibernating earlier this spring. And then they decided to open up a hunting season in 2009, um, but after several years of harvest they decided to um, initiate a reassessment of the population to see how hunting has affected their numbers um, and also just to understand how they've continued to expand throughout the four southeastern counties that have an open hunting season. So I'm just continuing with the data set um, trying to get a more robust assessment of what's going on because um, with a long-lived long mammal species like black bears Two sampling seasons is really just a snapshot. We're finding that our research has been extremely helpful to the wildlife department um, for them making their management decisions about hunting seasons and how many bears we have in each area and whether those populations are stable. It's great to work with the ODWC and it's gratifying to know that the stuff we're doing on the ground is actually helping them make their decisions. The really interesting thing about, about bears coming into Oklahoma is that they've been gone for uh, over 80, 90 years from the state and now they're moving back in but it's completely different than it was because now they're moving back in to a human do dominated landscape. The bears in Oklahoma and in Arkansas are predominantly vegetarians. So the, the um, acorns in particular in the winter, they get very, um, they, they go into a, a, a situation where they're trying to put on weight as, as fast as they can and as much as they can and those acorns are a great food source for doing that. There's no instance of the bears uh, attacking any livestock at all 
um, and they're just not focusing on meat. In your data, what are you looking for? Um, so we are, well, the data that we're collecting, we're collecting, you know, reproductive mm -hmm. data. Um, this is why we do our den checks to um, determine how many cubs they're having, how many females. Um, and then we're also looking at um, survival rates. We have uh, about 26 bears collared right now. Um, and so we can monitor their survival and know how many are getting harvested. Um, population growth for black bears is um, most sensitive to adult female survival. So this is why we primarily call our females um, and also that's how we get the reproductive data. And so we can kind of get an idea of how they're surviving in each, within each age class, yearlings, subadult adults. From there, deduce um, if the population is growing or expanding or declining. It's a much larger population, and even with the hunting season, this population is actually growing. It's doing well, it's more than stable, and it's got room to grow here. We'd prefer for them not to harvest our collared bears because it takes a lot of time and effort to get those collars on. And the grand scheme of what we're working on, that's just a success story, really. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime on our website and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.